God made the world, but the Dutch made the Netherlands. That's the famous saying. And sure enough, the history of this land is a tale of water management. For more than eight centuries, the Dutch have been busy holding back the sea, claiming new land from it and turning salt into fresh water. Even our famous Dutch windmills were used first and foremost to pump away unwanted water. If it wasn't for generations of engineering, all the land you see here would still be under the sea. My name is André Kuipers a Dutch astronaut at the European Space Agency, ESA. For years I worked here, at the site you see behind me. A relatively new addition to the Dutch landscape. ESA's largest establishment, the European Space Research and Technology Center, ESTEC. This is the place where almost every major European space mission is planned out, then tested for flight and future space technologies are developed to make new missions possible. Then I left it all behind. I became one of the 28 ESA astronauts to date who have visited space. Launched aboard a Russian Soyuz rocket, I joined the crew of the International Space Station. I carried out two tours of duty, 400 kilometers up in Earth orbit totaling just over 203 days in space. So why is an astronaut here to talk to you about water? Because the interesting thing is that my time in space only emphasized the vital importance of water. Because water really is life, down on Earth and up in space. And because space technology, developed by my former colleagues here at ESTEC, in the wider Dutch space sector and across the rest of Europe, has really added a whole new dimension to water management. It's a story I want to share. And for me, it really started during my trips to space. Living and working in interconnected modules like this, I was trained as a medical doctor before becoming an astronaut. But during my time aboard the station, I took on what might sound like a traditional role for a Dutchman, water management. Part of my role was monitoring our onboard use of water. The fundamental problem in orbit is actually one of scarcity. Of course, it's costly to transport water up to space, so we reuse all we can. Humidity from our breathing, sweat, wet towels, even our urine gets recycled. to be launched twice to the International Space Station. Launched in the Soyuz rocket from Kazakhstan and then after two days in the Soyuz capsule you approach the space station. A beautiful place, a beautiful lab in orbit around our planet. The space station is as big as a soccer field. It orbits our planet at 400 kilometers altitude with a speed of 28,000 kilometers per hour. It's the speed that makes it difficult to get there and to get back. And because you're going so fast, constantly falling beyond the horizon, we are weightless. It's fantastic to be weightless. You have to get used to it. And beginning astronauts get a bit seasick, space sick. After a while, it's a fantastic environment to float in. Careful, only one push of your finger is enough to float to the other side. Swimming is not needed, but you have the sensation of, of swimming because it feels like being underwater. 
And that's exactly why we also practice there. All the astronauts get training. The whole space station is in a huge pool in Houston, but also in Moscow and even Cologne. We have parts underwater. And there we practice. We live and work in weightless conditions. Now, on board of the space station, I had, of course, all the different tasks. Uh, a lot of experiments that we had to do. All kinds of experiments in different fields, in different modules. That's why we go there. Education is also part of it. And I had an experiment, for example, with liquids and see how they behave in weightless conditions for schools. And also an experiment with foam. How does foam behave when there is no up and down, when there is no weight? We also had operational tasks when there is spacecraft coming uh, with cargo from Europe, from Japan, from Russia, from America. And these bring, for example, fuel for the engines, but also new water. Now water, that was a major task. One of my tasks, water management. I had to deal with all the, the, the use of water on board. Now water is very precious. It takes a lot of money to launch something into space. So we want to recycle as much as possible. So all the humidity in the air, from our breath, from sweating, uh, wet towels, all the humidity in the air is condensated on cool plates and we make drinking water out of it. Also, our urine is recycled. We catch our urine and we clean it and make potable water out of it again. But it doesn't stop there. The water is used to make our oxygen. We split it in hydrogen and in oxygen. Now the hydrogen was going overboard in the past, but that's a bit of a waste because we take something else out of the air as well, what normally the trees and the algae do for us, carbon dioxide. So if you have carbon dioxide and you have hydrogen and you put them together, you have water again. And this way we recycle as much as possible our precious oxygen atoms. There is a leftover product, which is methane. We cannot use that, that goes overboard. But we want to recycle as much as possible. That means, of course, that we need big racks for that. Equipment to make it all work, to split it, to put it together, to clean it. And that also means that it takes a lot of maintenance. It's our oxygen source. So we spend a lot of time maintaining the environmental health system on board. Now, that also means that the toilet is a bit different than at home. The urine uh, we catch separately, we make drinking water out of it. And yeah, the toilet looks a bit different than at home. A lot of hoses and tubes and valves and filters, etc. So we're also plumbers on board. Well protected, of course, because, well, I hold here a urine tank. If it leaks, it floats. You don't want this in your eyes or in your mouth. My colleague Don Pellet, he invented a nice cup to, to drink a liquid in uh, weightless conditions. And uh, my colleague Santa Cristo Peretti, she demonstrates it here. So uh, because of the surface tension, the liquid stays in the cup and wouldn't flow out. With fluids, we can do interesting things. We do serious experiments. Of course, we use the water also to wash. Now, we don't have a shower on board because water floats. So we use mostly wet towels, but sometimes you also want to be really wet. And then you can use it also in a different way. You can put the water on your body. It doesn't fall down because there is no weight. So it sticks to your body and you get a film of water on your body. The equipment is well protected because it can also be droplets of sweat or coffee. Or, but here you can see nicely uh, how you can be really wet. It shouldn't get it in your nose because you can still drown in space in that sense. work 
but that was only part of the experience. We were living up there as well as working. We had to spend hours each day exercising to maintain our bones and muscles in weightlessness. It's the same for all astronauts. We had some downtime too. In my three hours, I looked back at our blue planet. Water is everywhere, from the turquoise Bahamas to the far Pacific, studded with jewel-like islands. It swells, glinting in the sunlight. This is why we have these beautiful windows as well. The nicest place is the cupola, a European-built cupola with windows around you. And in the bottom, from the outside, it looks like this. We have uh, protective covers for against space debris. So if there's nobody there, we close the covers. We call it planet Earth, but maybe you should call it planet Agua or planet Ocean. And it all started actually with Apollo 8. We know we live on a, on, a, on a globe, but if we look outside, the Earth is flat and the air looks endless. But from space, you can see that we live on a sphere. When this crew went around, they went away from the gravity field of Earth to the moon, they flew around the moon and they saw something special. Earthrise. First time through human eyes we could see our beautiful planet as a very fragile sphere in, a, in the blackness of space. The Apollo flights changed our minds and we were, were talking about spaceship Earth. We are all astronauts on a spaceship with limited resources. And that's something that uh, the astronauts also in low Earth orbit feel a lot. We call it also the overview effect to see the whole picture of the planet below you. We go with 28,000 kilometers per hour, so in one and a half hours you are back at the same place. The Earth rotates under you, so every time you see a new piece of the planet below you. So that means that 90% of the planet you can see from the space station. So a beautiful planet, a very thin atmosphere. You have the feeling that if you blow very hard that you blow off the whole atmosphere. 70% of our planet is water and clouds. That might be boring, but also there you can see interesting things. A real hurricane. You don't want to be under there. So even from space it feels threatening, the amount of energy that's in hurricane. From space you can also see interesting things in the water. Uh, big ice fields, of course, but also other issues. For example, here we look at the Canary Islands and you see ocean currents, the shading of ocean currents beyond the islands. And in the oceans itself, a lot of wave formations. And you see interesting patterns. Probably you don't now even notice it if you are there with the ship, but from space you see all huge wave fronts passing. So if you see it, you think, is this a tsunami? Uh, so maybe it's, it's underwater, but you can see these huge uh, waves from space. You find these volcanoes on the ring of fire around the Pacific. So talking about water, the Pacific is huge, even from space. And here you see Bora Bora, French Polynesia. And you see that it was a volcano. And the volcano starts to sink. On the edges, corals were formed. And in the end, it's only uh, a laguna left over from the volcano and a coral ring. Of course, because of sea level rise, some of these uh, islands are under threat because one day they are totally underwater and the population is diminished. This is a negative consequence of the sea level rise. Along the coast of Australia, you see these beautiful corals. Now, corals are under threat. Sea level rise, they don't like it. Temperatures rising, they don't like it. And it's getting more acid because of the CO2 in the ocean. So three factors why coral reefs are under threat. But it's beautiful to see the turquoise waters. Here we fly over the Bahamas. Florida on the left, the brown island is uh, Cuba. And that's one of the, the most beautiful places on the planet. Beautiful turquoise waters. You see all the nice structures underwater. You see on the left side the Nile River, but you also see the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba. So rivers are interesting to see from space. Here in the winter, a river in Canada, very nice structure. This is the Altiplano of Tibet. You see the Himalaya chain and on the foreground India. Now in these mountains, for example in Himalayas, but it can also be in the Andes Mountains, a lot of glaciers. Now glaciers are disappearing because of the warming up of the planet. 
for example, the melting water here in uh, going into the Brahmaputra, melting water out of Malaya, is very important for a lot, a lot of people. So you see more and more desertification. So sweet water supplies are going to be under threat in the future because of the disappearing melting water. Now on the other end, here we see uh, the Ganges Delta. Um, sea level rise uh, is an issue. So especially countries like Bangladesh, they don't have good dikes, so sea level rise is going to be a threat to a lot of people on this planet. I mean, many people live on the coastal area. This is the Zambezi. We see here the border between uh, Zimbabwe and Zambia, and uh, the white stripe in the middle are the Victoria Falls. Of course, a big river is the Amazon. And here you see uh, why it's called the rainforest. All these little clouds over the rainforest. Here we see Madagascar. It's almost, the forests are almost gone there and you see how the, the rain is flushing the, the soil into the ocean. Here we see the same, uh, Rio de la Plata. And then you can see human activity. The gray on top, just on the clouds in the middle, is Buenos Aires. We're looking at Argentina. Deltas you see very well. For example here, uh, the Netherlands and Estec. We see the Rhine River and the Maas and all the branches and on top of course uh, Great Britain there beyond the North Sea. We fly over the Sahara Desert and everybody wants to live on the water. This is where you always find the people. So the, the Golden Snake is the, the Nile River. Here we have Dubai with this little palm tree you can see. And here we fly over an um, interesting place. On the right side, the bright part, that's South Korea. On the left, you see the lights of China. In the middle, the dark part is North Korea. But what you also see is all these uh, fishing boats. You can see that uh, beyond South Korea there. And here you see it near the coast of Vietnam. And all the lights, all these little lights in the ocean is all fishing ships. And we look at the South Chinese Sea here, you see light blue uh, lights, purple, green, these are the real colors. These are all fishing ships. And then it's a visualization of the problem that we have in the oceans. Here you see also big fleets of fishing ships. And this is near the coast of Argentina. We have to be uh, careful with our oceans. They are not endless. All these pictures I took from the space station. You see things with the naked eye, but with satellites, you can see things much better. So we have the Earth observation satellites. I think this is the most important form of space flight that we have. We watch our planet in all kinds of ways. And the Sentinel satellites and the Copernicus program, so ESA is building these satellites and we can see a lot of things uh, that deal with water. Humidity in the ground, uh, the salt content here in the Mediterranean, or the turbidity of the river Elbe, for example. So we use this Earth observation satellites in this Copernicus program for all kinds of applications and also for the oceans. Now all the data goes down to, uh, to ESA, to Frascati, and there everybody who needs this data can, uh, can use it. Organizations, governments, etc. So these are uh, beautiful satellites. On these satellites uh, is, for example, a piece of equipment like uh, this uh, Tropomi, and they measure, for example, the air pollution over the whole planet in very much detail. So you can see also where the problems are. Big polluters on our planet are cargo ships. So a huge amount of pollution getting out of these ships. And you can follow that with the satellites in detail. If there is any uh, pollution coming out of rivers, oil pollution from ships, we can see that. And even for disaster relief, if there is a flood somewhere, then with satellite information, you get a lot of information which is very helpful for the organizations to take care of that. We measure the heat of the oceans, the heat of the land. Ice is melting. We have satellites like Cryosat, the ESA satellite that goes around the poles and measures the thickness of the ice. Calibrated with teams on the ice so you know that it's the right data. And the ice is disappearing. And we will have summers without polar ice. Now, uh, this ice is already in the water, sea level will not rise from that, but the ice on Greenland is also melting. And this is land ice, kilometers thick, and that means sea level rise. But it also might mean a change in ocean currents, for example. 
G-level rise is measured by one of the newest satellites of ESA, the Sentinel-6. So it measures the sea level, but also the roughness of the oceans and all kinds of different aspects for the whole planet. So that means that you get a good picture of where sea level rise is, uh, is causing a problem because it's not equal in all places. Every day our planet grows with 200,000 people. And they all want energy, they all want sweet water, they all want transport, etc. So we have to be careful with this planet. And space helps us. Space helps us to get the right information to make the right decisions. So we have to give the planet time to recover. On maritime level, we can do a lot and we use space flight to make uh, the planet clean and pristine again. Beautiful planet with the highlight, the Bahamas, beautiful turquoise waters. It's a pleasure to look at it and also a pleasure to dive. Because if I see it from space, I remember my first flight, I thought, wow, what would it be like to watch this underwater? With water so precious in orbit, I ended up wondering, what's the view like down at sea level? That thought stayed with me back on Earth. And it turned out there were colleagues I could find out from firsthand. Meet Peter de Maag. He's a senior ESA antenna engineer, helping to design and test the radio frequency systems that space missions use to gather knowledge and communicate with Earth. But in his free time, Peter is a diver and award-winning underwater photographer. As a diver myself, although not so experienced, we have spent a lot of time talking and comparing notes on how the same places look like from high above to right down in the water. Diving is something I've been doing for a long time. But I remember as a kid when I was snorkeling and I saw a shark for the very first time, is shot away from me. Not at all what you might expect. And that was it, I was hooked. That experience must have had a big effect because since then I've been scuba diving a lot with sharks. They are actually pretty friendly. And I got into photography because I wanted to share with everybody else the things I saw underwater. It took me a while to realize the connections with my day job because satellites do an amazing job to monitor the marine environment. I realized that the work I do is helping to safeguard marine life. In addition, I find myself looking at the photos that André and all the other astronauts take, along with the images sent down by satellites, you sort of learn to read them in terms of the things that you know from scuba diving. It's basically the same view, but just looking through different lenses. For instance, I can look at this satellite picture of the plankton bloom and know instinctively that the water down there is going to be pretty murky definitely not a good day to go diving. So you have just seen these amazing pictures of André in the space station and probably everybody is jealous, everybody wants to go in the space station. But on the other hand, the bit that André is missing is actually underwater and this is what I hope to show you now. So one image that André showed was when he was flying over Bali and this is what he's missing. Some pristine reefs, amazing colors, fantastic. The reds, the yellows, the oranges, it's just phenomenal. So the life underwater is as beautiful as from space. Looking at the picture of André again, uh, where he is flying over the Sinai Desert, and this is the image underwater. You see this beautiful coral, amazing. And the beautiful fish, the orange fish in this case, just swimming against uh, the, the current. Another image that you can see from André shows the downside of what we do to the Earth. Here he's flying over the Suez Canal and the Red Sea and the Sinai. You see the enormous amount of pressure that the humans are putting onto the Earth. It's light everywhere. 
And this is what I can also see when I go diving underwater. It's a very busy shipping lane, and I see this. There are plenty of wrecks. So I enjoy <laughs> diving the wrecks, but it's obviously the impact of uh, mankind. Now I go to satellite images, where you can see that in between the two islands, the mainland and the island, actually the water looks kind of dirty. And if I go diving, I can really see what that means to me as a diver. You see that the fish is actually living in the beer bottle in this case. So it doesn't always need to be extremely negative. It can also be positive. Peter has dive mates from all across the world, including fellow award-winning photographer Teresa Geis. In daily life, Teresa is a physician and researcher, studying how cancer grows in bone. As a physician scientist at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas, I study the tumor bone microenvironment. In many ways, this is analogous to the microenvironments in the ocean. I've loved the ocean for as long as I can remember, but I never lived out the passion until I started diving about 15 years ago. Underwater, a new world emerged for me. I explored the different microenvironments around the world, and I used photography to share these microenvironments and educate the public on the immediate need to protect the ocean and all its life from the negative impact of man. And here is an example where you clearly see the impact of rain. You see plenty of people living close to the coast, and I wasn't going to complain, I would probably be the same. I want to wake up in the morning, have my cup of coffee, read the newspaper and look to the ocean. The downside is the bushes and the trees get removed to build the, uh, the houses and it removes everything that prevents the erosion from the soil going into the rivers. And actually the two rivers that you see on the image, they're brown, they're really an ugly color. If you look a bit further into the ocean, you see a plume of sediment going into the ocean. And what it means underwater, you can see on this picture. The coral has completely disappeared. It's that. People are aware uh, of this and they start doing something about it. Regrowing coral. This is plastic tubes where little bits of coral are being grown. And as soon as these corals have decent size, they replant them uh, in the places where they should go. We've witnessed many good things that man has done to protect the ocean. Let's take Fiji, for example. It's home to spectacular coral reefs and a thriving shark population. Healthy sharks indicate a healthy ocean, but sometimes, like in Fiji, it takes human intervention to achieve this healthy balance. It all started with a local program in Becca Lagoon in Fiji, in which divers paid the local operators to dive with sharks. The proceeds went to the local villages, so they stopped killing the sharks. And over time, this resulted in the Fiji shark corridor, an expanded shark protected area which encompasses all of the reefs along a 30 mile area on the southern coast of Vidi Labu. This includes the Shark Reef Marine Reserve, Fiji's first locally managed marine park dedicated to researching and preserving the local shark population. This protection expands beyond sharks to include hands-on protection of reef environments. There are still a few things that are very difficult to see using satellite imagery. This image was taken on a particular day, and I'm pretty sure if André would be flying over, he would probably think that it's an amazing day. Sun shining, people uh, happy everywhere. Which is true. I mean, it was a fantastic day, the sun was shining. But when we went out diving, this is what we encountered. This poor turtle was caught in a fishing net. We didn't pick this up with satellites. It's nearly impossible at the moment with the current state of technology. But this is what you see when you go diving. We encountered several large accumulations of fish nets, known as ghost nets. Some of these had entrapped turtles, both green turtles and olive ridley turtles, which are endangered. What could be worse than seeing a turtle entrapped in a mass of trash? We immediately went to work. We managed to save this turtle and cut it loose and it was swimming away. Believe it or not, same location, next day, we saw another turtle caught in a fishing net. This one, we managed to set free as well, but it was in a much worse condition. So it managed to swim away, but I'm not 100% sure if it made it. Third day, satellite image, you see a few scattered clouds. 
We went diving again and then we saw this jellyfish just floating in plastic, in marine litter. And if you realize that the favorite food of turtles is jellyfish, then you can imagine that it's really difficult to distinguish between the jellyfish and the plastic around it. It looks the same. Based on our time on the water, there is a lot of pollution that astronauts or satellites can't see, like marine litter. 80% of it is made up of slowly degrading plastic. This trash injures animals through direct entanglement or else ingestion. And as well as degrading marine ecosystem in this way, plastic ends up getting eroded away into smaller and smaller pieces with microscopic fragments entering the food chain, contaminating the seafood that humans eat. So if you go diving and you experience all these events, you can't just sit back. It's obvious that we need to do something. And here at ESA, that's exactly what we're trying to achieve. The really surprising thing about marine plastic litter? While the estimate is 10 million tons of plastic enter the ocean annually, equivalent to a fresh truckload of plastic dumped every minute, we only know what happens to about 1% of it. Does the rest sink to the seabed, coat beaches or get broken up? About a quarter of a million tons is estimated to be floating the oceans right now, but computer models are too crude to show us precisely where. Astronauts and satellites can see floating marine plastic from orbit at the moment, but it's possible that in the future that might change. ESA optics engineer Paolo Corradi has been looking into what kind of technology might make such detection feasible. It all started while we were volunteering to clean up the litter on the beach at Norbike. The day we collected so much garbage that we started to wonder, well, would it be maybe possible to use satellite to detect high concentration of plastic pollution on the shore, as well as floating in the sea, as we do now, for example, for oil spill or even plankton. We began talking with marine litter experts in order to define the requirements of observation of plastic pollution and to see how remote sensing could contribute. One of these experts was Joanna Miravega, a marine biologist working at Deltares, which is an independent institute for applied research in the field of water and subsurface. Most people visiting the beach will surely have experienced the unpleasant sight of plastic pollution. Unfortunately, this is not restricted to the coast, and plastic can be found in virtually any part of our oceans, even in those parts that have little or no human activity, such as the deep sea or the poles. This litter can originate from many different sources. Recreation at the coast, tourism, maritime activities like shipping and fishing. But it can also be produced further inland and be transported into the sea, for example, by rivers. Once in the sea, the litter can be moved through winds and currents, potentially across uh, large distances, but it can also sink, it can also be ingested by animals, it can fragment into small pieces, it can accumulate in the famous uh, garbage patches in the middle of the ocean. So we can see that there's many factors affecting the distribution of litter in the sea, and this leads to a high degree of variability in the data that we collect. So, for example, if we were to come back to the same beach or the same spot in a few days, chances are that we would find very different uh, types and, and quantities of litter. 
we do collect a lot of data on the ground, but the oceans are so vast that these surveys are just snapshots in space and time. And this is one of the challenges that us scientists face. Although we know that the pressure of plastic wastes is increasing, it's actually hard to find statistically significant trends in terms of quantities and distribution of litter. And above all, to actually understand what are the sources that are generating this type of pollution. This is where the view from space can make a big difference because it allows us to cover a much wider area, repeat our observations with much higher frequency, and this helps us to draw a much better picture in terms of the amounts of litter that are out there and how it varies with the different factors at play. But most importantly, this would be very valuable information for policy and decision makers to actually inform them where interventions are most needed and to help them see changes due to these interventions. Our hope is then that by monitoring large areas via combination of drones, planes and of course satellites, we could one day generate uh, dynamic global maps of plastic pollution and not only in the sea, but also in other aquatic environments such as the rivers. No doubt this is a big challenge. Actually, this was considered at the beginning an almost mission impossible, not only due to the fact that uh, plastic accumulation large enough to be detected by the current satellites are relatively rare, but also because it's hard to give a structure to this very complex problem. Plastic pollution, in fact, can manifest in many different ways, materials and sizes, from uh, very large items such as fishing nets down to microplastic fragments. And it also appears in different patterns, from uh, uh, floating patches and filament-like aggregation to particles spread along the water column. Of course, we are aware that remote sensing will not provide all the answers, but will complement other measurement approaches in uh, what we envision as an integrated marine debris observing system. Having begun our research in 2017, the next step in 2020 has been to organize a large campaign of projects supported by the discovery element of the ESA's basic activities. Partnering with external partners across Europe, we are now exploring different technologies, techniques and remote sensing platforms to try to monitor marine plastic litter. We are performing computer modeling, in situ and satellite monitoring, and also laboratory experiments, sometimes using very large laboratories. Delta Aris test facilities include this Atlantic Basin facility, which is quite unique. It covers an area of approximately 650 square meters, and it can generate all kinds of environmental flow and wet conditions. For the ESA testing, we will recreate ocean conditions while several teams will perform remote sensing measurements of plastic litter to acquire signals from microwaves to visible light. It's going to take a lot of work to achieve our goals. What we hope at the end of it is that complementary monitoring strategies involving drones, aircraft, satellites and different optical and microwave-based instruments will shrink the gaps of our current knowledge, helping us to detect, identify, quantify and track marine plastic accumulation in the world. Of course, we know it's not only about gathering knowledge, but also taking action. In fact, there's a lot we know and can do already. Knowing that 40% of the plastic produced in Europe is used for packaging, no wonder that most of the litter found in the environment is used to deliver food and drinks or corresponds to single-use, short-lived items. And that is simply not sustainable. It's a waste of resources as well as a source of environmental damage. Fortunately, there is a, a new European directive which is now in place. It's unique in the world, which is preventing these type of items from ending up in the environment. And if we think about water in more general terms, in many places around the world, people rely on bottled water as a source of drinking water. So ensuring a good, safe access to drinking water would actually prevent huge amounts of plastic being generated, and especially in places that don't have capacity to deal with all that waste.
the really alarming thing about plastic waste is that it is a problem across so many scales, from the large pieces threatening marine life to the tiny micro fragments that we might end up eating and drinking without knowing it, accumulating in our own bodies with unknown consequences. But space has a contribution to make when it comes to ensuring clean water too. Here in ESA's Life, Physical Sciences and Life Support Laboratory, their research includes filtration technology to keep water supplies pristine for future astronauts. The other part of their research is to develop enhanced recycling systems for future space missions. Up on the International Space Station, we recycle all we can, but it isn't enough for future deep space missions where crews will need to stay entirely self-supporting by themselves for years on end. On Earth, we get all the oxygen, water and food we need from Earth's ecosystem. We can take all of that ecosystem into space with us, but maybe we can take some of the key parts. That's the idea behind Europe's long-running micro-ecological life support systems alternative, Melissa to develop self-sufficient life support systems. The 11 Nation Melissa program has been running for more than a quarter of a century, with a pilot plant in Barcelona that has succeeded in keeping isolated crews of rats alive and healthy. Meanwhile, Melissa-derived technology has also spun out into the real world. Meet Dutch horticultural specialist Peter Scheer who has a very special drink to share with me. So Andre, can I offer you a nice cup of fresh mint tea? Absolutely. From P to T. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. Very nice. My name is Peter Scheer, I'm the CEO of Semia Sanitation and I'm also part of the accelerator program of Nijhuis Soar Industries. I'm in front of our growing room, our climate room, where we are testing our urine fertilizers to grow fresh vegetables and fresh mint. I was a horticulture specialist, but actually my profession turned into wastewater treatments in yellow, black and grey water. We work on a prototype uh, of a urine treatment system to turn urine into 90% clean water and 10% fertilizers. We want to serve uh, refugee camps, uh, disaster relief areas, and the best we could uh, test it on was on festivals. We invite people to come and pee. The process of urine treatment is uh, we have a vacuum evaporator and we, in we were inspired by uh, space technology. So we pre-treat urine, so ammonia will not appear, no uh, odor, and then we vacuum evaporate the urine and we boil it, uh, the water will come out, we will distillate it again by condensating, and then the concentrate, the leftover, is actually the starting point of the new fertilizer. And then we ask them, please do you dare to drink your own tea? Because we turn pea into tea. I'm Esther van Loon and I'm an implementation specialist at Sumia Sanitation. So currently we are in Doetinchem, it's in the east of the Netherlands and around me you see uh, a storage room where we uh, keep our systems uh, but also we have an office there where we uh, think of new ideas and where we do our research. In the containers there is a fully equipped uh, system where we can treat uh, wastewater uh, but also where we can treat water to make drinking water. I work uh, mostly in Africa, where I uh, implement closed loop concepts. So what that means is that I look at the water pathway and uh, I look at where do they get their drinking water from and what do they do with, with their wastewater. I look at the water pathway at a certain area in that country. I look at uh, four water streams. I look at groundwater or uh, rainwater, grey water that comes from showers or from washing your hands, yellow water and black water. And that's a mixture of urine, feces and water. What is currently the water situation? Where do they get their groundwater? And uh, what happens to their uh, sewage or to their pit latrines? I use the principles, the right uh, water resource, 
for the right water demand under the principles of reduce, reuse and recover. You can take groundwater or rainwater, you treat it and you make shower water from it. This doesn't have to be as clean as drinking water. And this water you can use uh, for the showers and after it's been used, you treat it to make uh, water for flushing the toilet. In that step, you are reusing and reducing your water usage. You can recover uh, nutrients from urine and also from black water. What we tried on festivals is, okay, what uh, can we turn uh, fast urine into clean water and fertilizers? But also we want to know uh, the opinion of our visitors. Uh, what do, do they think about the idea that they could drink their own pee? Because yeah, we need to work on water because water uh, is becoming scarce. I saw uh, really amazing techniques of treating grey water, yellow water and black water and at Asia actually, at the Malaysia program, uh, my interest in treating water uh, started. We want uh, to go from waste to taste. So as a horticulture specialist, I had 20 years experience of vertical farming, actually growing systems underneath LED, LED technology and multi-layer system, completely controlled. So uh, what we want to do is to use space technology uh, take nutrients out your own body and feed it to the system to grow your own uh, vegetables. Your body contains a lot of nutrients, uh, up to 13 grams, and you could easily make 400 grams of fresh vegetables daily on your own body content. So we really want to change the system that you are uh, going to harvest your own uh, donations and turn it into fertilizers. We want to close the loop also uh, towards a Mars mission. So if you could use your own nutrients uh, to uh, feed yourself, uh, that's amazing. We face that uh, more than a billion people have no access to uh, good sanitation and more than 600 million people don't have access to clean drinking water. So we have to make sure that we use our water resources really carefully and that's why we want to make treatment systems what will help all over the world to uh, supply in clean water and good sanitation for everyone. So we designed a new project in the Netherlands based on space technology, a water neutral and sewageless street. So we will supply in 28 houses uh, rainwater towards drinking water, uh, shower water will, will turn into flushing water for the toilets and the black water will be treated and turned into compost, uh, nutrients, so plant fertilizers and uh, dischargeable water, clean water you see an increasing number of people using medication. The medication is broken down by the body and is uh, being expelled from the body and it's getting into the sewage. So the latest trends is that we see that micropollutants are contaminating the water and micropollutants are microplastics and medicine residues. There's uh, more hormones getting uh, into the water, but also uh, antibiotics affecting uh, the, the fish in the water. And for this reason, uh, we should start uh, removing medicine residue from, uh, from the water. So currently, we have systems in place to remove medicine residues, uh, and we are investigating the opportunities with microplastics. Our main goal is to, to uh, provide systems for Africa and Asia, because the world uh, population is growing a lot, and we have to feed a lot of mouth. So uh, we need to make sure that everywhere in the world there is clean water and good sanitation. So my end goal is uh, making clean water and do on water treatment in Africa and, and beyond. The space sector keeps coming back to water. Here, at the NL Space Campus in Noordwijk, close to Esther, the latest satellite radar images are used to keep watch on the Dutch flood defenses, looking for early signs of subsidence. Sea level rise is, of course, very important for the Netherlands, of which half is under sea level. So with Sentinel-1, we measure changes in, in movement of a millimeter with radar, and that means that we can use this uh, information to watch the dikes. And the dikes are, of course, very important to keep the water out. Space technology goes on, making the difference across many scales, from protecting our landscape from climate change, to safeguarding ecosystems from human waste and pollution, 
to safeguarding the water we drink and ensuring it stays clean and healthy. Because the view from space down to planet Aqua makes it even clearer. Water is life everywhere.